Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. My name is Marie Horova and I'm a senior advisor in the ECB's research department. It will be my pleasure to guide you through uh, this session uh, at the conference. Our money market conference would not be complete without a session on repo markets. We will have two papers in this session today. The first paper will examine how access to safe assets affects the fragility and lending behavior of financial intermediaries. The second paper will investigate the issue of money market segmentation. Presenters will have 25 minutes, discussions 10 to 15 minutes, and this will leave us some time for a discussion afterwards. Without further ado, I'll give the floor to Tony Annert from the ECB, who will present his paper on liquid assets and financial fragility. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the nice introduction. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you to the organizers for including the paper in, uh, in the conference. So this is joint work with Marco Machiavelli, who has been until very recently at the, at the Fed Board of Governors, giving us nice uh, access to confidential data. Uh, and he has just moved to um, UMass Amherst. And we've been uh, working on this uh, for a couple of years, and we've just finished a substantial revision of the paper. So I'm very happy to show you the, the most recent uh, version of it. So, the, so this is a paper on uh, money market mutual funds. And uh, I'm going to call them uh, money funds for short. And they issue uh, shares that are redeemable on demand. And then with these funds obtained, they invest in short-term debt. And they come in uh, two forms. So some of them are, are, are government uh, money funds uh, investing in, in liquid government debt. Um, and uh, others are prime money funds that on top of those asset classes, they can also invest in more illiquid and typically higher yielding short-term private debt. So think about commercial papers, uh, certificates of deposits. And as a result of the illiquidity and, and risk of uh, some of their assets, we have seen that they're subject to runs. I mean, both in 2008 and in 2020, there were runs on, on prime money funds in the United States. So the question, that we are trying uh, to ask and understand in this paper is whether financial stability could be improved by providing liquid assets to prime money funds. And thinking about uh, this issue, uh, pro publicly providing liquid assets, uh, liquid and safe assets, could affect financial stability in at least two ways. So first, we have the relationship between the creditors of the money fund and the money fund itself. So if the money fund has access to liquid assets, it does not need uh, to engage in costly liquidation to meet uh, redemptions, to ac accommodate redemptions. So that would, uh, could reduce the run risk of the money fund. If we now move to the next layer, to kind of the real effect uh, of this, uh, money funds fund the real economy, uh, corporate firms. So as money funds become um, uh, safer, less subject to run risk, they can also engage uh, in more lending to the real economy. That is, even in, in terms of stress, there could be continued or even improved lending to the real economy, improving financial stability via this second channel. And the uh, ambition of this paper is to study exactly uh, these issues, both theoretically and empirically. So let me, let me give you the results of the paper in one slide. So on uh, the theory side, we are constructing a parsimonious global game model of runs on money market mutual funds. So in particular, we're going to show that the provision of liquid assets, which empirically will be by the Fed via the overnight reverse repo program, reduces the strategic complementarity in the redemption or withdrawal decisions and hence it reduces the run risk on or the run risk of money funds. 
As a result of the greater stability of money funds in a crisis, these money funds are actually able to continue lending to the real economy. So they are uh, going to have kind of measures of, of lending and, and, and risk taking, allowing them to extend uh, funding uh, to borrowers exactly kind of in, in troubled times. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, this lending will be in, in terms of illiquid assets. So there will be kind of liquidity and, and maturity transformation. And I'm, I'm going to have much more details on these two headline results uh, later on. And then we, we take the model to the data. We, we believe we can offer uh, quasi random assignments uh, to a treatment, that is the access to liquid, liquid assets. So we're going to have a, a treatment and a control group. So some money funds have access to an extremely liquid and safe asset, which is the overnight reverse uh, repo facility of the Fed. Um, and we're going to have uh, treatment and control groups. And then there will be an exogenous stress event uh, that triggers outflows from uh, money funds, which is the debt limit episode in 2013. So the, the United States is a peculiar uh, country in the specific sense that once you approve the budget, you still have to uh, change the debt limit. So there's always this additional a parliamentary process that is required. So even if there's uh, a clear majority for any measure in the budget, you still have the problem that you might run up against uh, the debt limit. And if, unless the debt limit is uh, increased, there could be a government shutdown, there might even be a technical default on, uh, on debt. So using the combination of the uh, staggered adoption of the overnight uh, repo facility by money funds and this arguably exogenous uh, stress event, we provide evidence that the public provision of safe assets uh, indeed, consistent with the model, uh, reduces financial fragility, both at the level of the money funds and at the level of the ultimate borrower. So let me, so I'm an applied theorist, so let me talk a little bit uh, about the model. So we're going to uh, construct a global games model of uh, investor redemptions. So the, the money fund has uh, made some investments. Investors receive a noisy private signal about the performance uh, of these investments. And as a result of that signal, they decide whether or not uh, to redeem their shares. I mean, very much as kind of in a bank run uh, setting. And we're building on a particular paper by Chen Goldstein and, and Chiang in, in the JFE, who have looked at uh, redemptions from uh, mutual funds, um, but only uh, with one asset. So we're going to look at, at a different market, we're looking at money market mutual funds, and we introduce asset heterogeneity. So the fund holds a portfolio of risky and liquid assets. The risky asset in our application is this lending to the ultimate borrowers via uh, asset-backed commercial paper, CDs, and so on, which is, uh, this is kind of fairly illiquid investment, so that's very costly to liquidate. At the same time, these money funds hold some liquid assets, in particular, the uh, overnight reverse repo and treasuries. So the, the, the overnight reverse repo is the safest asset around. It's backed by collateral, safe collateral, uh, and the counterparty is uh, the Federal Reserve, so arguably uh, no default risk, plus it matures the next day. So this is the, the safest possible asset. And usually treasuries, uh, government debt, is, is safe as well. So usually these two would basically be interchangeable but not in October 2013. In October 2013, we had this debt limit episode uh, and, and treasuries uh, became costly to liquidate. I'm going to show you a, a chart in a moment that is, you, you have, nobody thought that the US government would default. So if you hold your treasuries until maturity, you get back both principal and uh, interest. However, if you face uh, large redemptions and you have to liquidate, then there was a cost. 
And at least in this episode, we see positive liquidation costs for treasuries, and I'm going to show you uh, this slide shortly. So the difference between control and treated funds is that treated funds have access to this perfectly liquid asset, the overnight reverse repo, while control funds only have uh, government debt, which in normal times would be, uh, would be fine, but in this kind of particular crisis episode, uh, was uh, um, exposing them to, to risk, in particular uh, liquidation uh, cost. So we, we know from this literature of runs on, on mutual funds that these redemptions can impose a cost on non-redeeming investors. This is what sometimes uh, is called the strategic complementarity uh, property. And these costs co uh, may arise because uh, selling involves some uh, transaction uh, costs or some market illiquidity such as these uh, uh, cost of liquidation of, of, of treasuries. And the key aspect here is that this cost is not fully borne by redeeming investors. So if I choose to redeem, unfortunately, I impose a negative externality on all of you if you don't redeem from the same uh, given fund. Note that, of course, in 2016, there was a, there was a reform and there was a, ch was a change. And we can discuss, uh, you know, we can discuss the efficacy of that reform. In any case, our data is from 2013, well before that reform. So, uh, so we are we are kind of in a period where it's very plausible that we have this externality in this strategic complementarity. Interestingly, once we introduce a portfolio choice or we introduce kind of liquid assets. We, we need not have strategic complementarity. We could also have strategic substitutability. When there are only very few redemptions, um, then I can use the liquid assets to meet these redemptions. And then actually uh, the, the pie to more, which is going to be fairly big, will be shared among uh, fewer investors. So actually, if uh, you know, the liquidation cost is small and there are few redemptions, uh, I actually prefer you to redeem just means this amazing great pie is shared among fewer investors. This is not true in a standard bank run because uh, in banking we have a deposit. We have deposits, which is a debt-like claim, while in money market mutual funds we have an equity-like claim. So we share among all of the equity holders at the end. So this, uh, this makes it theoretically very interesting because we move from kind of strategic substitutability to strategic complementarity. Fortunately, there's the seminal paper by Goldstein and Paulson on the Journal of Finance in 2005, which in 30 pages of appendix, give us the, uh, the methodology to deal with what's called one-sided strategic complementarity. Uh, we apply this to our setup <clears throat> and generate uh, a unique equilibrium, which we can then use to um, derive comparative statics, and especially for the empirical part of the paper, testable implications. Our first implication is that money funds with access to liquid assets, the ONRRP, will be less fragile. In empirical terms, treated funds experience smaller outflows in response to at-risk treasuries during the debt limit episode. Did I do that? There has been a change in the monitor. OK. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of the headline result, treated funds uh, are less fragile, we then slice and dice uh, the, uh, the sample um, by showing this is particularly so for money funds with a lot of active investors because active investors respond uh, to news and then the degree of strategic complementarity is, is particularly high, while funds with a lot of passive investors, uh, the, the channel is, um, is less strong. Also. Uh, we've been recently asked uh, to clarify whether this is really kind of a one-like uh, mechanism uh, at play or is it just some general risk aversion. So we, we have provided new and additional evidence in the, in the most recent version of the paper where we show the result really comes from the least liquid funds. So this is in response to the shock, those at-risk uh, treasuries, uh, those funds that are particularly illiquid uh, respond most to the availability of ONRP. So that is consistent with our one-like behavior, but inconsistent with the general risk aversion story. 
And then the second headline result is that because money funds with access to liquid assets uh, are more stable, they uh, liquidate less of their portfolio, i.e. they continue funding the real economy more. So let me, let me show you uh, a bit on the empirics, if I can. <laughs> this is not responding, or oh, now it's responding. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the ONRP. So this is a facility the Fed um, um, started kind of more than 10 years ago. And the key fact here to know, this is for monetary policy. So that at this point, uh, interest rates were really low in the US. They knew they would start increasing interest rates over time and they wanted to have a firm grip on um, on, um, on kind of uh, the interest rate and on kind of monetary policy transmission. So they inc introduced this additional tool. So this was purely for monetary policy reasons. They, you know, if you also look at the, the, um, the statements by the FOMC, there was no talk about financial stability considerations. So the uh, eligibility meant that you needed to have assets under management of at least $5 billion. And in terms of identification, uh, what's really helpful for us is that in September 2012, you had to apply for this program. But then you could only use it in September 2013. And we're going to look at funds that in September 2013, so one year after the application deadline, they look virtually identical. So in terms of, of, of observables, they're, they're very similar. However, the treated funds did not miss the deadline. They actually applied in September 2012 and they, were, uh, they had access to the facility while in the control group, those funds missed the deadline. They had not applied, although they would be eligible in 2013 if, uh, if the Fed uh, would uh, have a new application deadline, but the Fed did not have, have it. They only had it in 2014. And indeed, in 2014, all, all of those funds, well, with one exception, but all uh, N minus one funds did apply uh, to become eligible. So we have this, this really nice period between September 13 and November 14, where we have uh, observationally equivalent funds. Some of them have access to the ONRP and the others don't. So we have treatment and control. And uh, all we need now is before November 14, we need a shock. So fortunately for us, uh, there was the, the debt crisis in, in, in the US. So that gave us a, a plausibly exogenous uh, shock event. And uh, here we see, so this is October 2013, we see that uh, treasuries, um, so bill yields of these treasuries went up. So in normal times, treasuries are super liquid, super safe. So their yield is like one basis point, two basis points. But here it's going up to something between 30 and 50 basis points. So that is if you, if you have to sell treasuries uh, at, uh, during the debt limit episode, then you're incurring a loss. And so we're combining these two things, this exogenous stress coming from uh, at-risk treasuries in, in that period. So we're going to calculate the share of treasuries that are at risk uh, and interact that with the, uh, the kind of staggered adoption of uh, ONRP and we can uh, compute uh, treated versus uh, control uh, money funds. So the data is mostly publicly available with the exception of ONRP take up, uh, which is, uh, is data you only have access to at the New York Fed. And this is our first uh, main question. We want to look at flows, which is the change of assets under management, responding to a bunch of controls, the, uh, whether we are in the, in the crisis period, which is the debt limit episode, and the exposure to uh, um, at-risk treasuries. So the share of, at of treasuries that are at-risk, that are in this period um, before the debt limit episode was resolved. So this is our first main table. 
So if we look at sample three, for example, we see that uh, in, in, the, uh, in the first column, crisis times at risk leads to a significant coefficient that is negative. So if a money fund has a larger share of its treasuries uh, in terms of at-risk treasuries, uh, then uh, there will be, will be outflows. And then the second column is the treatment versus control effect, where we compare uh, money funds of similar characteristics, just the treated funds had access to the ONRP, the, the completely liquid and safe asset uh, that is out there, and that fully undoes the effect of, of the outflow. So we see the magnitude of, of basically one for one. So the, having access to liquid assets stabilizes money funds in crisis periods. So that's our first main financial stability implication. And we're going to have two more, I mean many more, but uh, two more tables in the paper where we show this is mostly driven uh, by money funds with a fairly large share of active investors and it's mostly driven by fairly illiquid uh, money funds in the sense uh, that uh, the, um, the average time to maturity is fairly long. So they cannot just sit it out. If, if my assets mature in a day or two, uh, then that's fine, I just wait for a day or two and then um, I'm using the maturing funds uh, for redemption. Consistent with this uh, bank one, or a redemption uh, type uh, mechanism, as our model suggests. So we've talked about the first leg. The first leg was the investors in, uh, in money funds and a potential one on the money funds. And now we wanna talk about kind of the, the real effects uh, side, where we see how this affects the lending of, uh, of money funds to the real economy. So we are constructing this measure called prime risk. So this is lending to the, uh, to the real economy kind of anything that is a bit risky. So this could be commercial paper at tier two um, and um, a, a foreign bank obligations, kind of anything that is not uh, super safe. Uh, and then again, if you look at sample three, for example, we again first have the effect that during the debt limit period, during the crisis period, having more exposure to at-risk uh, treasuries reduces your lending to the real economy. So there are, there are actually many, many nice stars there, so that's a fairly strong uh, and economically large effect. But then again, in blue, if you're a treated money fund, if you have access to uh, the uh, overnight reverse repo, you have access to the liquid asset, then this basically fully undoes the negative effect. This insulates you uh, from the shock. So our, <clears throat> our conclusion is that uh, with a publicly provided um, liquid asset uh, that improves the stability of the money fund and allows it to uh, continue lending uh, to the real economy, even in terms of crisis. We do many robustness tests. Um, one of them is one concern could be that this is driven by manager skill, that somehow is kind of an alpha story that some managers are good at avoiding certain risks. We find no evidence for that in, in our sample. It could be that uh, take up of uh, overnight reverse repo is um, kind of correlated with um, uh, with, uh, with observables, we find no evidence of that. Um, we look at the, at the possibility that overnight reverse repo actually doesn't help you at all. So it's not about that you're not incurring liquidation costs, it's just about if you have access to that, you kind of get a stamp of approval, what's sometimes called the imprimatur effect, but we find no evidence of that. Um, there are also some concerns where we find evidence in the opposite direction, where actually, if anything, our results uh, get stronger. And then uh, in terms of, uh, I, I should also say that we have fairly few funds. So in, in terms of constructing treatment and control group, we want to be very careful that they look very similar. 
So uh, the consequence of that is we're actually down to 20 funds. So the, you, you see from those confidence intervals, so they're, they're, they're just positive, <laughs> but they are, they are fairly wide. No? So the, uh, we, we do find um, that the, you know, the pre -existing, there are no pre-existing trends, but significant trends afterwards, but the confidence bands are, are fairly wide. And we do a few other tests uh, in the paper. But all of them, such, uh, so all of these additional channels are not significant, suggesting that we can conclude that the uh, public provision of liquid assets, in this particular case uh, by the Federal Reserve in, in 2013 via the overnight reverse repo program, um, delivers two separate financial stability benefits. The first benefit is the relationship between the investors and money funds. So this is the, the funding side of money funds, making money funds less fragile. And the second benefit is that this law of fragility allows money funds to keep lending, in, in some setups even increase their lending uh, to the real economy, even in, uh, in times of stress. And you know, some of that is uh, second tier asset-backed commercial paper, these are foreign assets. So this is really, there's kind of some risk taking involved. This is really, um, uh, not just investing in, in, in safe things. So as a result, uh, some concerns that the provision of liquid assets could lead to kind of a flight to safety uh, channel in times of crisis is not borne out in, in this particular episode and in our data set. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for a very clear presentation. The discussant of the paper is Puria Abassi, who is joining us virtually. Puria, can you, ha can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Can you hear me? The slides are being uploaded. Now we see them. If you make them full screen. Excellent. The floor is yours. You have 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you, Tony, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very important and interesting paper. Uh, needless to say that the usual disclaimer applies. <clears throat> um, well, liquid assets are crucial for many reasons, right? Um, on the one hand, they, at the investor level, uh, they are very, very crucial for hedging, diversification motives. Uh, they actually serve um, as pricing instruments, benchmarking tools, uh, they play a pivotal role in regulation and supervision, but also uh, for the transmission of monetary policy uh, and by their effects on um, uh, supply and demand and their interplay, they also can actually shape uh, financial market real economic real um, out outcome there and thereby also affect financial um, this is one of the reasons, or maybe the key reasons, um, why the provision of safe assets to the financial system has been a core central bank function uh, during normal times, but especially also during financial crisis, as they um, help providing an impetus for sustainable recovery. Now, liquidity provision already prior to the financial crisis of 2009 uh, and 2008 uh, has been um, provided through various facilities, uh, the lend of last resort facility, the interest rate on excess reserves, open market operations, but even more so uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So a challenging question could be, why is this topic then on the agenda today, right? And it is on the agenda because the provision of liquid assets uh, runs through the balance sheets of depository institutions, right, which are uh, in, the, um, in the pole position to provide it within the banking sector among financial firms, but also to the real economy. Also, over the last decades, there's been an increasing trend in, in, in participation of non-bank entities with increased footprints in financial markets. Also, it's been shown that frictions may actually arise even in the context of ample liquidity when there is heterogeneous bargaining power or access um, to central bank facilities slash the lack thereof. Beck and Clay showed this for the US, Spike and I did this for the Euro area. Now, Tony and Marco actually focus on the latter two points, right? So they look into the, um, the increased participation of non-bank entities and try to understand um, what an access to central bank facilities can actually do in overcoming short-term fluctuations. And they study this in the context of the Federal Reserve's overnight reserve uh, purchase repurchase program, which um, started in 2013. 
And it basically grants money market funds access to an altered version of the IOER facility or the deposit facility in the euro area. And the idea behind this is money market funds lend out funds overnight to the Fed, receive treasury securities as collateral in the form of tri-party repo, and receive an overnight uh, RRP rate. And again, this is very similar to the concept that we all know from the IOER facility for depository institutions. And Tony and Marco focus on primary MMFs simply because those MMFs have uh, more holdings invested in non-governmental securities. And they try to uh, find out whether there is a differential effect in, these, um, in the way these MMFs perform with and without access to this facility. And they do this over the exogenous event uh, in 2013 when the debt ceiling standoff in the U.S. actually occurred. When I started uh, basically preparing this uh, discussion, I um, ran across the, the paper by colleagues at the board, which I found pretty, pretty interesting. So this is the period um, surrounding the 2013 debt ceiling um, uh, standoff. And in five business days ending on October 16th, there's a huge net redemption from prime MMFs totaled to $15 billion and a substantial reduction in CP outstanding declines to uh, 20 billion. So this setup alone raises the natural question, does access to a sort of uh, central bank reserve facility help to reduce outflows during su such a standoff period, right? And that happens to be the question of the paper. And the long hypothesis of the paper is MMFs with more cash-like assets or you may also think of this as uh, those with zero average cost of liquidation by means of holding marketable assets which they can uh, resell easily, are better equipped to internalize short-term fluctuations, for instance, by meeting withdrawals or redemptions. And there are two key insights that the paper uh, generates. And Tony, forgive me for um, simplifying the vector of results that you, that, that you guys produce in the paper. So on the theoretic front, um, what is a major takeaway is that zero average cost of liquidation helps MMFs to internalize losses and withdrawals. But on the other end, higher marginal cost of liquidation induces fire sale type dynamics, right? And this is what uh, Tony um, discussed as complementary, one-sided complementary strategies. On the empirical front, there is um, results provided on the differential outflow for affected MMFs depending on whether they had access during the period to this ONRRP facility or not. This is a super interesting and important uh, paper and topic that it actually uh, tackles. It fits nicely into the recent literature emphasizing benefits of the public provision of safe short-term assets and enhancing financial stability, as Tony has stressed, by displacing private money-like assets that are prone to run. Jeremy has a paper on this, among many others. It's very carefully executed, polished, and you can see that it has already gone through the major revision that Tony talked about. Uh, my comments are more some sort of a melting pot of ideas that I had that I tried to cluster it, um, within these buckets. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, go through the first and the second, the third bucket and leave the rest as additional comments uh, that Tony, you and I, we can discuss uh, over a coffee. Um, so when I started thinking about the paper, it actually reminded me of um, how models like the diamond dipping type of model can uh, consider and talk about financial fragility, where a financial institution actually must choose between short-term safe assets, like investments in the overnight RRP, and a long-term technology. Right? And an exogenous increase in the return of such a safe asset, which would be consistent uh, with an increase in the overnight RRP rate, could actually have two effects. One, substitution effect, because the tendency to increase investments in the safe asset as its relative return makes it more desirable. On the other end, also it has an income effect because there is now a tendency to reduce investments as one can earn the same income with lower quantity of asset, for basically the same asset. And exactly, it's not very clear to me which one of those effects will dominate. And I think there is um, a lot to be learned um, from whatever the, the outcome of this uh, rationale is. Now, when I thought about the theor theoretical uh, part of the paper um, and tried to link this with the empirical part, I somehow left puzzled. And maybe this is because I simply didn't get it. Um, 
on the theoretical front, it felt to me like it depends on the availability of liquid assets with zero cost of liquidation. This basically means it focuses on the market liquidity, that is the ease with which one can sell an asset to somehow um, overcome a trigger which has, uh, initi which has been initiated on the liability side. And as at the end of the day, depending on the share of marketable assets that each MMF holds, this might actually have an uh, impact on the asset and the liability. But then when I went on to the empirical part, I learned that what it actually does is it uses the availability of liquid assets, hence cash, to borrow treasury securities and the overnight facility, which felt to me like focusing on funding liquidity, the ease with which one can ease uh, use an asset for refinancing. And there, the trigger in the uh, analysis is basically on the asset side. So funds that actually with an ex-ante highest share of affected securities go into a troubled uh, episode. And somehow uh, the question becomes how they actually manage to keep the or maintain the same level of assets under management. This felt to me like we're talking about this swap on the asset side, right? And I'm not even sure you need the literature to motivate for the dynamic that you're interested in. This is at least my takeaway from this because the liquidity spiral basically just reminded me of this or even the uh, fixed, the patient fixed income investor uh, rationale that Huntsnet I actually brought forward among many others, right? Okay, uh, so this is on the, I have obviously also some uh, specific comments, which as I said, um, uh, I put in the additional uh, comment section at the end of the slide. Now, when I basically just jump to the last part, which uh, is what can we learn? Because Tony, you um, stressed the fact that it actually helps us to talk about and think about financial stability. What is the big picture lesson that we can take from this, right? Uh, so ultimately, can you say something on the aggregate effects? Uh, the commercial papers, the results that we saw, at least for the control MMFs, um, raise the natural question, can borrowers from control MMFs compensate the reduction that you show across other entities intermediaries markets and what happens to the aggregate level of short-term funding because as you correctly said um we're talking about 12 funds here 12 versus eight funds and i understand uh that there's a trade-off uh by you know having a larger sample versus identification as you mentioned but it would be neat to understand what does it tell us about the aggregates plus the outflows that you that you see and show for mmfs for the control uh group is this associated with inflows out elsewhere? Again, feeding into the question, what is the effect on the aggregate? Also, um, the paper seems to have a positive connotation on uh, lending to the real economy, um, which is also an emphasis on private money like asset creation. And my question is, is more lending always better? And this, I think, goes to the question uh, of capital allocation slash capital misallocation and where is it allocated and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, even if we take everything at face value, the question becomes uh, the graceful, what about the mechanics of the graceful exit, right? Because the facility has been introduced as a temporary facility and the question becomes once there is a phasing out to be planned, what are potential symmetric slash asymmetric effects, which uh, in the literature has already been raised. Last comments. Um, I can see why there is a beneficial effect um, that you highlight in the paper. But here's another thought. Can elastically supplied risk-free assets, like an investment in the ONR um, RRP facility, amplify run dynamics or even alter flight to quality dynamics? 2008, 2011, 2013, there were episodes where flight to quality episodes alter destinations of safe haven flows, right? Cash that in absence of such a facility might have moved quickly to liquid deposits at banks could go to this deposit, uh, sorry, to this facility through government MMFs in results, leaving prime MMFs um, experiencing larger outflows and a reduction in the availability of short-term funding in like repos and CCPs, which would be, um, uh, very, very uh, important and interesting for financial stability considerations, right? And all I'm trying to say is it would be neat to have a more balanced discussion about not only the, the benefits, but also the shortcomings of such a setup and what it actually does uh, with all the different challenges that we have ahead of us, potential QT, restrictive monetary policy episodes, and so on and so forth. So in conclusion, 
Um, it's a very, very, very interesting uh, topic. It's a super uh, neat paper. It's already polished. Um, my comments basically try to give some hints as to whether the, the link that has been established in the paper between the theoretical framework and the empirical part is necessary in the way it is. Uh, maybe some additional robustness text that I didn't talk about today, but I have um, as part of additional uh, slides. Uh, maybe the paper could say something on the big uh, picture lesson and provide a more balanced discussion uh, of the identified effect from a system-wide perspective and obviously its implications for financial. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Puria, for an excellent discussion. Um, I suggest we collect a few questions from the floor and then give the word back to Tony to address it all at the end. Um, the floor is open for questions for Tony. Your question? Yes, uh, thank you. A very excellent uh, study and uh, very nice to have this empirical evidence in, uh, in the US. My question is, uh, would you uh, extend this uh, uh, research also to the European situation? Because we have money market funds here all, also, and I would be interested whether this would help the European situation as well. Can I, in the meantime, also add a question? So, uh, Tony, you highlighted the benefits of public provision of liquid assets through the RRP facility of the Fed. Uh, in your view, what frictions prevent private provision of safe and liquid assets, for example, through the repo market? Okay, uh, let me let me try to uh, answer some of these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Puria, for an excellent discussion. Awesome. Uh, great job. So I'll definitely take you up on uh, on the coffee uh, and want to want to learn more about the additional uh, robustness checks that that, that we can do. Uh, and also, uh, it seems that we overlooked some very important contributions in, in the literature. And we're very happy to uh, to cite them in, in, in the new version. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, it's I like how you think about the uh, theoretical model and you know talking about how changes in uh, in the return on liquid slash safe assets could have income and, and, and substitution effects. There is, so in the context of a bank run model, there's, a, 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 there's actually a theoretical analysis by, by Philip Koenig uh, at, the, at the Bundesbank doing, doing exactly this and, and as you suggest, finding a, an ambiguous relationship. What, what we have done here is actually we, we took uh, the, the short and sweet way out by assuming that these liquidation costs only happen when you have to liquidate. So there's this kind of difference in the benefit without the cost. So in the, in the environment you suggest that there's, in, uh, there's you know, an ex-ante portfolio choice where I hold a low yielding asset that is very liquid and helps me meet redemptions, but there's also a risky and high yielding assets. And then I have to think about benefits and costs. And in order to circumvent this uh, interesting but uh, complicated analysis, we, we make the assumption that uh, there's just this, uh, this liquidation cost. So, we, are, so we, we fully agree with this concern, uh, which is why we try to work uh, around it. Um, <clears throat> you, you talked about market versus funding liquidity, and I want to you know, think a bit, a bit more about that. Um, uh, I, I'm not too unhappy about it. So if uh, at the end of it, you feel like the model is no longer needed because uh, all the effects uh, are intuitive. So that's, uh, that's not uh, the worst uh, place to, to be, but, uh, but hopefully uh, you know, the model itself might also offer some, some insights. And uh, in terms of the big, big questions, I think you, uh, you, you make some, uh, some great suggestions. I think it, it would be interesting to think about spillovers, GE effects, welfare effects. So far we thought that's kind of beyond the scope of this particular paper, but maybe, uh, maybe there's some, some follow-up work uh, that, uh, that could be done. Um, 
One concern is sometimes when you uh, try to identify something kind of hopefully cleanly and we already have the problem that we are kind of down to 20 funds, then going back and try to aggregate everything and talk about the aggregate effect sometimes is, is kind of difficult. I mean, I have some uh, empirical papers with a model where the, my identification is not so clean and then I actually can talk about the aggregate effects very easily and then I get the opposite. Usually I get the opposite concern that, uh, that they're concerns about uh, the identification. So it uh, it's, it's, can be challenging. Um, one thing I think uh, we should actually clarify is in, indeed implicitly more lending uh, is good. I mean, that's uh, a bit of an implicit assumption here. Um, kind of positive NBV um, uh, project with some risk. Uh, maybe we should we should at least qualify a bit because we indeed don't talk at all uh, about potential uh, costs of lending. Yeah? Um, so we we just happened to, there was a question about US versus Europe, so we just happened to uh, have access to the European data and we, we found this lucky coincidence about uh, staggered adoption together with a crisis, which seemed to have worked uh, for the empirics, but um, I'm definitely, you know, it's very important that we, uh, and some people in, in the room have done, right, uh, that we look at uh, the European market as well and and um, understand these things. I mean, what I like about the project, the question itself, you know, the public provision of liquidity and what are the financial stability implications. In principle, we can use any country and, and any jurisdiction uh, to study that. You know, I mean, sometimes US data is actually not so good. I know some of the colleagues at the Bank of Canada sometimes benefit from, from high quality micro data. So, and then you can, wherever good data quality is available, we can use that to try to make progress uh, for, these, for these questions. Um, we have not, one of the other things that we have not done and maybe uh, uh, should do is think a bit more about the private, uh, uh, the private uh, provision. I, I guess it could be that, uh, I mean, usual information frictions might, uh, might, uh, might kind of prevent a, a purely private uh, uh, arrangement to work, but it's probably something we have to think a bit more uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony and Puria. Thank you.